Uh, my pleasure to be with you folks tonight. Um, thanks for coming out in the rain. I, I came from the northeast, and apparently this storm is derived from the southwest, so I can't take credit for bringing you the rain, but uh, we're certainly glad to have it in the desert. Um, what I want to do for you tonight is, is take a little journey to Chaco Canyon. Uh, let me see a show of hands. How many of you folks have been to Chaco? That's great. I mean, it is one of the most phenomenal places, not only in the Southwest, in the U.S., but in the world. Um, I don't think anyone should live and walk on the earth without seeing Chaco Canyon before they die. Um, I tell people frequently when I give talks that you're, you live in the center of the archaeological world right here in Tucson and in the Southwest. Um, there are archaeological wonders worldwide, but we are so blessed in the Southwest. So. Um, get out and see your local archaeology, and please come to New Mexico, see us at Salmon Ruins, and go to Chaco Canyon again, because you really can't go to Chaco too many times. Um, what I want to emphasize for you tonight um, is the diversity and the complexity of Chaco Canyon. And I'm not talking here so much about social complexity in terms of complicated societies. Um, Chaco certainly has some claims to that, but I just want to try in a few minutes tonight to really expand your definitions of Chaco. Um, as I've looked at Chaco Canyon over the last 10 years with the center and really about 20 years, 10 years prior to that, so 20 years or so um, in my career, I feel that our interpretations of Chaco have sort of narrowed through time. That um, Chaco Canyon has, as you're all are well aware, an extensive 150-year history, 160-year almost at this point, of research and exploration. Um, in the last 10 or 15 years, I feel that we've taken this broad Chaco Canyon phenomenon, the archaeology, the sites, the ancient people, and we've really narrowed them to the point where we are vastly under-interpreting Chaco Canyon. So what I want to do for you tonight is just throw out some ideas that I hope will cause you to think about Chaco perhaps a little more broadly. Um, we go to Chaco Canyon and we get an interpretation that the Park Service has worked hard to give to us and I think that tells us part of the story but um, there's a lot more to Chaco Canyon. Um, Chaco is a very complicated story. Um, it's an interesting story and I think, we can, I think we can handle the complications. I think professional archaeologists can handle them and I think interested people like yourselves, um, professionals and interested lay people can handle the complicated explanations of Chaco. So I want to step away from what might be a trend towards simplifying Chaco and sort of open it up again and take on some of these complications head on and, and see where that takes us. The main thing I want to talk to you about tonight um, are the amazing Chaco Great Houses. Great Houses really are Chaco. When we think of Chaco, we think of Great House architecture, we think of veneer patterns, um, patterns of masonry carefully laid down in a number of places, first in Chaco Canyon, then in the places that Chaco and people and the Chaco and tradition went to in the middle San Juan where I work, uh, places like Solomon and Aztec and places to the south um, where we see signs of Chaco influence and or actual Chaco migration. Um, so if we look at the great houses, these are the large Chaco structures. I'm talking about Pueblo Benito, Chetro Kettle, Pueblo del Arroyo, Hungo Pavi, Pueblo Alto, a whole long list with it, about a dozen of these great houses in Chaco Canyon between 1050 and about 1125, 1130, along with earlier occupations and later ones, of course. And then the vast system of Chaco and sites that came out of Chaco, people came out of Chaco, the ideas came out of Chaco, and came to spread across most of the greater San Juan Basin with 100, 125 sites by 1100, 1125 that were affiliated with this, this great Chaco thing, this Chaco and world. Um, and we have actually within this class of great house, um, the site type that archaeologists have uh, defined or tried to define, we have a great deal of diversity. Okay, we have sort of the largest class, the true great houses in my mind, places like Pueblo Benito, which has 675 to 700 rooms, over 30 kivas, four great kivas. Um, its sister site in Chaco Canyon, Chetro Kettle, which has on the order of 600 plus rooms, um, 
four or five great kivas associated with that site. Looking to the north um, of Chaco, in, in my home territory, we have Aztec Ruins, Aztec West, um, the first Chaco and Great House there, with over 400 rooms, um, a great kiva, and then a large complex that grew around Aztec. And we have Salmon Ruins, my, my home, if you will, a site of 275 to 300 rooms with a great kiva, a tower kiva, um, all of the Chaco and trappings. Now, there's certainly other sites we could put into this Chaco largest great house class, if you will. Um, but what I want to contrast with you now is the sites on the wee end, the small end of Chaco, okay? We have Chaco great houses, which fall into these categories, get put on maps, which have as few as 10 rooms. We have a site at Hogback, New Mexico, which isn't far from where I live, about 15, 20 miles. We have a great house in Newcomb, New Mexico, which um, we've heard about a little more recently. Um, these sites have 10 rooms, literally. Um, the footprint for Newcomb, New Mexico, is not much bigger than this room, perhaps a half of this room. Um, Newcomb has a whopping 10 rooms. It has a kiva, a Chaco-style kiva, that's enclosed by a little plaza. Um, so you may be thinking, and I know I've had this thought um, when I've looked at Chaco, what, what are these great houses? We have 675 rooms at Pueblo Benito, and we have the Newcomb Great House, the Hogback Great House, with 10 rooms. You know, this doesn't sound like a very archaeologically well-constructed class, does it? You know, 10-room site without the Chaco and trappings, which I'll talk about in a minute, that's a pretty small site. Um, it's not a bad site. It's not, may have been a very good home for people. But why would we put a 10-room site in a class with a 675-room site? It's a very good question. Um, the reason we do that is because of the construction of the 10-room site. Um, these 10-room sites at Newcomb, Hogback, and a few other places have many of the Chaco and trappings. So we have massive, meter-thick walls. Um, we have core veneer construction. So we have carefully constructed veneers that face into the rooms on the inside and also are nice veneers on the outside. And these are integrated with a rubble core, which is other rock that's not shaped as carefully as the veneers, and these occupy a big footprint. Um, we have kivas that are built in directly to the room blocks, which is not strictly a Chaco and trait, but it certainly became sort of a hallmark and a calling card, if you will, for Chaco through time. Um, we generally have more than one story construction on great houses. Now that, I say generally because we have sites like Pueblo Alto that's in Chaco Canyon, it's about 80 rooms on a pretty good floor plan, about 200 feet on a side. But Pueblo Alto is an interesting and rather diverse um, Chaco Great House to talk about because it's a single story structure. We have a single massive story of construction, meter thick walls, and about 12 feet high at the top. So Pueblo Alto certainly fits the general notion of a Chaco Great House, but it's only one story. So should we throw Pueblo Alto out? Um, Something to think about. I'm not saying we should. Um, we drop back down to Hogback and Newcomb, these 10 room great houses. The second stories on these structures are somewhat questionable. Um, they've collapsed through time. They date to the 1050 to 1125 era. We're really not sure how, how much further they went up, if they were actually one or two stories. But even if they are two stories, we have at best um, 10, 15, 20 rooms. So should these be considered great houses? Um, we'll see. Um, then we have a whole broad range of medium, medium class great houses. So the ones that aren't the monsters, we're not talking Pueblo Benito, Chetro Kettle. Um, we're talking about sites that have a couple hundred rooms, which are certainly large sites by any standard in the Southwest, certainly by Chacoan standards, but they're not the monster 500, 600 room sites. They're not um, what I think of as the wee or tiny class of great houses with 10 or 15 or 20 rooms. They're just kind of medium class great house sites, okay? And these, examples of these would be places um, like Morris 41. This is a, a medium sized great house. This is in the area I work in the north portion of the La Plata Valley, just below the Colorado border. About 100 rooms, a nice Chaco layout and plan, um, an E-shaped um, or squared C-shaped Chaco layout. We have two stories, about 100 rooms. We have a blocked in, good sized Chaco Kiva. We have a great Kiva in association. So certainly a good Chaco site by any standard. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you we should throw that one out, but 
as we look at this class of sites, we have lots and lots of modes, if you will. We have at least the three, large sites, medium sites, small sites. Um, if you graph these out by size, you actually end up with seven or eight distinct modes in Chaco and Great Houses. So that tells us some things that are very important. Um, and I want to talk to you briefly about these classes then and, wh and what they tell us. Um, the biggest of the bigs, sites like Pueblo Benito, Chetro Kettle, Aztec West, and Salmon, I think were built primarily as residences for people. Okay, these are homes. I'm going to say to you these are not primarily ritual structures. They have very important ritual functions, but they weren't built primarily as ritual structures. Okay? Folks, these walk like Pueblos, they talk like Pueblos, they smell like Pueblos. So my conclusion is they're Pueblos. This is not the interpretation you get if you pick up your average textbook on Chaco, if you go to Chaco Canyon and talk to the folks at the Park Service. They're going to say, no, these are sacred, special ritual structures. Well, archaeologists have studied these, studied these things for some time. We have a sense, and we've learned this from Pueblo people with what they've been willing to share with us in the past and in the present. They have ritual structures. What do they call these? Kivas. That's the Hopi word. We've adopted it. Um, certainly all of the Pueblos have different labels that they apply, but they have these round, large ceremonial structures. We have great kivas in the past um, and smaller clan-sized kivas, other kivas through time. Kivas seem to be, throughout Pueblo history and prehistory, the dominant ceremonial structures. That makes sense to us. So we have this class of structures that comes along, these great houses, and yet we have this interpretation then that's largely a product of the last 20 or 25 years that tells us that great houses are primary ritual structures. Folks, I scratch my head at that. Because any of you have gone into Chaco, you go through these amazing buildings, and then you read the interpretation that says, Oh, 72 people lived in Pueblo Benito. 72? This is a 700-room Pueblo, folks. And 72 people ran through Pueblo Benito in the ancient times to build enough fires, to break enough pots, to, to create enough chipped stone to fool the archaeologists later into thinking that a lot of people had lived there. So I would tell you, a lot of people did live there. And Pueblo Benito is um, perhaps a, a hard site to discuss. We know Pueblo Benito has a very complicated history. It's built, begins to be built initially in the eight, 860s and 870s, and it grows through time, over 400 years of use, into the 1280s, and abandonment through many stages. It starts out as a very small, crescentic shape, typical Pueblo of the 800s and 900s, and then many, many rooms are added through time. There are special burial chambers at Pueblo Benito um, that had um, contained the burials, we think, of special people in the Pueblo, leaders perhaps, that run through time. Pueblo Benito has amazing artifacts that were deposited there. So the site sort of illustrates for us this complicated Chaco in history through time. And I think Pueblo Benito probably evolved from a residence to a much more ceremonial site later in time. But I'm just silly enough to think that people still actually lived at Pueblo Benito and that they needed to live there because to many of them it was their home. So as we talk about great house structures, let's not, let's not get confused and try to simplify this too much, okay? The one take home message I want you to have for tonight is Chaco and great houses are both residential and ritual structures. And there's no false dividing line that we're gonna put into these. They're both, both things are going on in all of these sites. And that's a really important point. Um, now, as we look at other classes of great houses, um, other sites, um, we can ponder um, this notion of the small great house and really wonder what was the motivation for building a site with 10 rooms that went through this careful Chaco and selection pattern where you got the right rock, you built a massive structure, albeit on a smaller scale. Um, you put meter thick walls into a single story structure that might not have been more than nine or 10 feet high. Now when you're building Pueblo Benito and you know you're gonna go up four or five stories and reach perhaps a height of 50 feet at the top, Aztec ruins, similar, Salmon with its three stories, you have to build massive walls at the base to support that. If you're building a small great house, um, why are you doing that and, and what's going on? One of the things I would tell you is that by the time Chaco and people and Chaco and ideas started to spread out of Chaco Canyon, the notion of building great houses and the style of Chaco and architecture 
was intrinsic to the culture at that point. So if they were going to build great houses at whatever size and scale across the landscape, they were going to do them the way they had done them in Chaco Canyon. What they did simply was they scaled the structures to their needs in different areas. And local people, if they were building great houses, they scaled their structures to those needs. So that, I think, is somewhat complicated, but also, if you think about it, a relatively simple explanation for why we have small great houses that appeared on the landscape. These structures were designed for different purposes than the massive ones that held large numbers of people, large numbers of artifacts. So if we're building a 10-room structure on the San Juan River at the locality known as Hogback, uh, just about 15 miles west of Farmington, this site was built because a 10-room structure met the needs of the people at that time. It didn't represent a large migration movement of people from Chaco Canyon, for example, to take up residence at that location on the San Juan River. Now, if we contrast that with Solomon Ruins and Solomon Pueblo, built at about 1090 on the San Juan River, we have a 300-room structure that was built in perhaps the most rapid interval of any Chaco on site that we've been able to date. So between 1090 and 1100, a structure with three stories and up to 300 rooms was erected on the San Juan River. Well, folks, there's a real different process in building a 10-room great house with all the Chaco characteristics and a 300-room great house with all those Chaco characteristics. And I would tell you that Salmon first and later Aztec ruin in the middle San Juan, these sites were built as part of a migration movement of people out of Chaco Canyon, not just the migration of the ideas, but the actual physical migration of people out of Chaco. And this is a trend that we see in the period from 1050 to 1075 and then 1100, which is a shift in focus from Chaco Canyon to the north into the middle San Juan. Now Chaco wasn't abandoned after this time, things continue to happen in Chaco, but I think we can say, based on the research we've done, that the ritual focus of Chaco, a large part of it shifted first to Solomon and then ultimately to Aztec ruins, and that the complex that developed at Aztec ruins came eventually to rival and perhaps to replace what was going on in Chaco Canyon with the movement at this point. Um, if we can perhaps agree then that Chaco and sites are diverse, that maybe this deserves another look, that maybe we should get past the notion of great houses being great houses no matter where you see them, then you know, what are we to make of this diversity? What should we talk about? Well, what I would tell you is that it's very important to do um, careful study of each of these sites and to not lump them as a class and say, oh, these are great houses. We know they were Chaco and built, and that's all we need to know. We should look carefully at the things I've been talking about, the size of the sites, the way they were constructed, where they were constructed, and when they were constructed, because all of these things are going to give us clues. If we want to just look at a synchronic or single point in time and say, here's the Chaco system, it's 1100, we can map all the sites, we can say, okay, here's Chaco 50 years later, 1150, here's all the sites. That's going to help us at some level, but what we need to do is get into these individual sites and learn as much as we can about them and not paint our Chaco in picture with such a broad brush stroke that we lose the detail that matters. And this kind of circles back for me to the theme I introduced to you earlier, which is let's take the time to understand this complicated picture of Chaco and settlement. Let's not paint it with too broad of a brush. Let's not dumb it down. Let's not say it's too complicated or we like the simple explanation. Let's dig into the details of Chaco and let's try and understand what we're talking about. Um, so what would we say about why Chaco is so diverse? Well, one of the things that has come out in the last 20 or 30 years of research is that Chaco seems to have been a mix of multicultural, multi-ethnic peoples. We have burial studies that indicate at least two different populations in Chaco that have linkages to peoples, modern peoples and peoples in the past, both to the east and to the west of Chaco. We have indications at other sites like Salmon Ruin of what people talk about as ethnic co-residence, where we have people with distinct biosocial or ethnic origins coming together to live in a single place, to build a site, and to join up, if you will. Um, so I think we can look at, at Chaco as a multi-ethnic um, and highly social gathering of people and a society. Um, I like to talk about this as a confederacy of different peoples um, in different sites and across the landscape. Um, this doesn't lend itself to the notion of a single unified Chacoan system.
if we looked at all the sites and didn't bother with the details, we might come up with that explanation. But when we drop down to the site level, we start to talk about it, look at some of those details, we see many different sites, we see many different groups of people coming together. And they're sort of under this Chaco and rubric and this overall confederation, but it's not a unified system, it's not a unified group of people. Um, that doesn't, for me, make it any less interesting. In fact, it makes it more interesting. But it does suggest to me that we need to focus more on the diversity, and at that level, the complexity and sort of the complicatedness of Chaco if we're really going to understand what happened. Um, and that's my, that's my spiel, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Okay, we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, I just want to point out right away that Paul knew we were going to put this online. So, Paul, you've thrown the gauntlet out, so uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> okay, we have a question right here. Paul, I may be uh, misremembering, but my last visit to Chaco, I remember having it pointed out to me that there are many rooms that to enter them, you would have to go through 10, 15, 20 dark and labyrinthine passageways in other rooms to even arrive at them. Right. So how could this be a residence? Right, and you're talking about Pueblo Benito yeah. primarily. Well, that's, that's part of the evolution that I talked about. Pueblo Benito starts out, especially with the rooms that ended up being in the back of the site, um, as a residence. But as they added more rooms through time, they did, in fact, seal off areas. They used those rooms, um, two areas at the north and in the west, um, as primary burial chambers, and those rooms were completely sealed off through time. So the site grew through a process of accretion and accumulation of rooms over 300 years that ended up with a much different footprint and a much different layout than we saw, for example, at 900, 950, or 1000. So Pueblo Benito is, is, does represent a complicated case, and that's why I spent some time talking about Benito as sort of an unusual example of a Chacoan site that evolved through a primary residential phase to one that was probably more ceremonial in a lot of ways, and where residents shifted from the back to the front of the Pueblo. Okay, and I've got to apologize for the sound quality. We moved our sound system out and connected to the sound system on the house, so there's a little bit of uh, disconnect between our mics and their mics. Um, while, I, while I've got you on, on, the, uh, on the microphone, though, could you summarize some of the other arguments that were used to create this sort of vacant ceremonial center model? Sure. Um, you know, part of the, the evolution of Chaco's vacant ceremonial model, which many of you archaeologists will recognize as a somewhat discredited notion from Mesoamerica, in the 70s and 80s, archaeologists talk about Mayan sites as empty ceremonial centers because there was difficulty identifying residential sites around the large Mayan temples and pyramids. And additional archaeology in the jungle showed that there were, in fact, many, many residential sites that surrounded these sites. Well, if we use that analogy for Chaco, we have the small pueblos surrounding great houses in Chaco. If we take great houses out of the equation for Chaco, um, we still have literally hundreds of small pueblos that date to different time periods, but a clustering um, and sort of a concentration of those small pueblos in the prime Chaco time, 1040 to about 1120, that would have supported lots and lots of people, even if we don't want to put 1,000 people in Pueblo Benito or even 500 in Pueblo Benito. Um, so there's plenty of people if we look in the small sites, and especially if we add in population from the larger sites, um, in, in, in my understanding of it, the empty Chaco ceremonial center um, hypothesis, if you will, and model that's um, become a reality for a lot of folks comes from the Park Service's work at Pueblo Alto. This is the large site above um, Pueblo Benito on the Mesa top. This was excavated by the Park Service primarily in the 1970s and then reported in a series of documents in the mid to late 1980s. Um, they excavated a sample of uh, Pueblo Alto's 80 rooms, something between eight and 10 rooms. So they sampled about 10% to perhaps a little more of the site. 
and the remains that they found in Pueblo Benito did not, to the investigators, support a model of residential usage of Pueblo Alto. Um, sorry, I said Benito, but I'm talking about Pueblo Alto. Um, there were, nevertheless, lots of artifacts that came out of Pueblo Alto. Um, there was pottery, there was bone, there were lithics. So there's a very rich archaeological assemblage that came out of that. They also sampled areas in the front of Pueblo Alto that had considerable artifacts. Um, so I think, Doug, to sort of go back to the question that this developed from excavations there and the fact that sites like Pueblo Benito and Chetro um, Kettle were excavated, um, and this is mostly between about 1890 and 1940, and not a lot of um, in-context features and artifacts were recovered from floors during these other excavations. So part of the reason we have, in my mind, um, a less than complete model of Chaco is we haven't had a large site in Chaco excavated in our lifetimes. Pueblo Alto was sampled. Um, the site that I'm fortunate to work at, um, Solomon Pueblo, was extensively excavated in the 1970s. More than a third of the 150 ground floor rooms were excavated or sampled. So we have an incredible collection of archaeology from Solomon, and what we have supports residential usage of the site. We have different types of features, fire pits, roasting pits, um, grinding facilities, storage facilities on the floors of ground story rooms in Solomon that suggest um, long-term residential usage. We also have a very regular pattern of room suites that Cynthia Aaron Williams, the investigator at the time in the 1970s, suggested were discrete apartment suites of a kind that families used. And that model works extremely well. Now, Solomon has room suites that don't appear too many other places in the Chaco world, at least in the excavated um, suite of sites. Um, a site like Hungo Pavi in Chaco Canyon, which has been sampled but never excavated, seems to perhaps have some similar types of suites. Um, and if I was going to dig in Chaco, in case any of you were wondering, I would sample Hungo Pavi. Um, Jim Judge, uh, actually, I had a conversation with Jim relatively recently, and Jim was like, I wish I could go back to Chaco and dig Hungo Pavi. Because it really is, it looks like much more of sort of a typical, if you will. Now, I've told you there's no typical great houses. Hungo Pavi is sort of a prototypical site because it was built on this um, E-shaped plan that became sort of the footprint for all later Chacoan sites, including Solomon, Aztec, and a number of the smaller outliers. So let's do Hungo Pavi. Next question. Don, if you hold the mic a little away from your mouth, this is working. Are there large garbage middens associated with Pueblo Benito, and if so, what do they reveal? There are large mounds in front of Pueblo Benito that um, a recent project that um, Chip Wills and Patty Crown um, sampled. They re excavated Neil Judd's trenches from the 1920s work that was sponsored by National Geographic. and. They found, not surprisingly to my mind, apparently surprising to a few other folks, um, tens of thousands of artifacts out of those trenches. Now, at this point, um, I've seen a couple of symposia that were presented at the uh, Society for American Archaeology meetings, and Chip has published, Chip Wells has published some preliminary reports. He hasn't reached um, sort of the final publication stage with his work. But I believe the diversity of artifacts found there supports use of that area as a midden. Now, Steve Lexon has a fairly um, complicated argument for those being artificially created mounds, um, and he really discounts the notion of midden deposits there after a certain interval. But I think we have to wait and see the dating of ceramics that came out of um, the recent work and how that's going to fall in the Chaco time period. If all of the ceramics are 800s and 900s, and then we have a gap in the later 10 hundreds sort of prime time Chaco ceramics, then we might have an argument for not a lot of domestic trash being deposited there. But at this, at this point, with the level, the volume of artifacts, um, I think the jury's still out. And I think the suggestion that those are largely non-midden deposits really isn't holding up. OK, I think there was a question up here. Could you, uh, you probably answered this already, but why did the first settlers of Chaco decide to build multi-story structures instead of single-story units? The land was not particularly restricted, I don't think. And uh, I wonder why they wouldn't want their own privacy uh, if there was no threat of uh, 
land use or some other restriction? Okay, so basically why do we have the development of multi-story Pueblo and structures? Um, it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> you know, the locations that, that um, held early Chaco and settlement at a large scale. Now we have early, earlier settlement in Chaco with two large sites in the Basket Maker Three period on elevated mesas, the site of Shibikashi and a, a sort of a sister site to the west with dozens, hundreds of pit houses really. That's in the five and six hundreds. And then we have a transition to Pueblo One, which is roughly 450, 500 to 700, 750. And we have settlement in Chaco. There's sites there. So um, some of the things we read about Chaco suggest that there is a Pueblo Two explosion at eight, well, late Pueblo One, 875, 900, 950, with people coming out of nowhere. Well, we have substantial earlier settlement in Chaco Canyon. Um, at the point at which we begin to see second story architecture in Chaco, um, there are trends across the Pueblo world where people are beginning to build larger and larger sites. They're building what many archeologists consider the first true villages after 800, 825, 850. And Chaco is certainly on the leading edge of that. Now we have sites to the north um, in the Dolores, Colorado area, which are large villages and multi-storied at that point. So I think what I would tell you is that social groups at that point had simply grown to the point where they needed additional space and they embraced multi-story architecture. We really don't have a smoking gun for why people started to go up. But those early steps in Chaco and Dolores and a few other areas did ultimately lead into the massive Chaco sort of dominant core veneer architecture that we see later. But that's, that's one of the things we're continuing to investigate. And I don't think anyone has a particularly good answer for that. Excellent question. Does Hovenweep fit into the Chocolin world? Hovenweep um, has earlier sites that overlap with sort of prime time Chaco, 1050, 1125 to 1140-ish. Most of what's preserved at Hovenweep and as part of the National Monument is later Pueblo III era remains. So we're talking 1200s and for a lot of the tower sites um, that, are, that are well known and famous, those are post 1240 and 1250. So the tower phenomenon, by and large, that we see in the north is a late Pueblo III. A lot of folks think it's tied to um, defense and not necessarily active warfare, but certainly the notion of conflict late in the Pueblo world in the late Pueblo III period. Another question? If I'm remembering right, some of the arguments for Chaco being a ceremonial center was lack of hearse in the rooms um, and also lack of uh, enough agricultural space to grow corn to feed all those people. Right. Um, with looking at the hearse first, our excavated sample of Chaco rooms in the modern era is 10. We have 10 rooms at Pueblo Alto, and I, I can't tell you right off the top of my head if two of those rooms had hearse or three or four. Um, we basically have very little sample with which to apply hearse equals residential usage. Now at Salmon, for example, um, the work that was done in the 1970s in a recent reanalysis that I did, on Chaco era floors, in 25 rooms, we had 60 hearths that occurred at different levels. Very strong evidence all by themselves of residents. Um, <coughs> one of the problems with Pueblo Benito <clears throat> is simply the lack of good excavation data for the 400 or so rooms, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> Those 400 or <clears throat> so rooms that were essentially pot hunted between 1895 and about 1905, <clears throat> along with a, a series of rooms that Judd excavated, which also really weren't handled in, according to modern standards. So <clears throat> we can, people make the hearth argument, but I don't think it holds up really well for Chaco. Um, with regards to agricultural lands, there are studies ongoing um, right now and, and for the last few years that show a pretty extensive series of fields. And if you look at Gwyn Vivian's work from the late 60s all the way, um, you know, into recent things that Gwen has done, I think there's 
plenty of agricultural potential in Chaco. Um, we look at Chaco today, we see a 40 foot deep entrenched Chaco wash. We see um, to our Western 21st century minds, a horrible desert, des desertified, impoverished landscape. That's not what existed particularly in the 900s and the 10 hundreds when we started to see extensive development and building in Chaco. Some of those decades in the 900s and 10 hundreds had one and a half to two times the precipitation. So if we take Chaco from seven inches of rain to 14 inches and we make Chaco wash an intermittent stream that flowed at least six or eight months out of the year, the Chaco environment changes dramatically and we really do have the oasis that a lot of us think existed there that brought people in. Because if we don't have that, when we all go back to the head scratch and we say, why would people come and live in Chaco? But the, the earliest sites established in Chaco were right where um, side drainages from Chaco came into Chaco Wash or Chaco River, and those were the prime lands to plant agricultural fields that would take advantage of that runoff. And I don't think that's a coincidence. One sec. Just for the heck of arguments. <laughs> uh oh, Rich, um, you don't get to ask any questions. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I was just wondering about your take on the astronomical alignments of the sites and how they're organized together, what kind of a more recent view on all that is. Well, I, I, I think the astronomical alignments are real. I think they're important, and I think they were very important to the, to the peoples of the past. Um, but I consider some of the emphasis on those uh, a horse and a cart problem. Um, some people feel that Chaco Canyon was built primarily so these buildings could be aligned to the sun, the moon, and the stars in a number of complicated patterns, and so that complicated geometry could play itself out on the landscape primarily as monumental architecture for its own state. I would tell you to turn that around and say people wanted to live in Chaco, it was very important to them to align their buildings to the sun, the moon, different alignments, and to have the construction of their architecture and their landscape features reflect their underlying cosmology. So it is important, but I would just turn that emphasis around. And I wouldn't tell you that Chaco was built primarily as an observatory. Uh, Chimney Rock, on the other hand, was built in my mind, and in a lot of folks' mind, primarily as a place to observe the rising of the moon between the two rocks. That seems pretty obvious, and that, that holds up to research. Um, but I think, it, personally, it's a mistake to look at the ancient Chacoans primarily as astronomers who built um, different monuments to um, mark out different alignments of the sun and the moon. They were farmers. They were people making a living. They weren't that different from farmers in any other era of the world or of different places across space and time in the world. But they had concerns with the heavens, and so they therefore aligned their buildings to reflect that underlying cosmology. Um, so I would, I would just turn that around and say, yeah, it's important, but it's not the primary reason for Chaco. One sec. Earlier, you said the Chacoans came from the east and the west. Can you be more specific? Well, I was referring to some studies that have showed close affinities between burials and different points of Pueblo Benito and um, the relationship of biogenetic traits to people that were um, older burial, burial populations sampled from Grand Gulch as one example, and then other sites to the east. So essentially, if you do different genetic studies, you find correlations between these different outside earlier populations and then features in Chaco. Um, that work is, is fairly, um, there hasn't been a whole lot of it done. A lot of our um, Native American friends have issues with those types of studies, so that's a fairly sensitive area of study. I think it could be very productive. Um, but at this point, sample sizes are fairly small as well. So I think about all we can say based on those studies is that we do seem to have a lot of genetic diversity in Chaco and we don't seem to have an initial population that just grew naturally without in-migration from different areas. Next question. One sec. You mentioned multi-ethnicity earlier, and I wondered if you could give a couple of examples of 
what you see that contributes to that? Okay, well, beyond the, the biological diversity that uh, we've seen in um, some of the bone and um, skeletal studies, what we have um, at Solomon specifically are certain parts of the site that reflect a greater dominance of ceramics from the local area, the San Juan area, versus other parts of the site. And this isn't an east-west split. That would be a little too easy, too convenient. Um, but we have uh, concentrations of Chaco and ceramics in good context that we think are primary or you know, in-place refuse um, that indicate primary Chaco and residents, perhaps people, and versus local areas that show greater dominance of San Juan-style ceramics. This is not a smoking gun, but it does suggest that we may have dominant patterns of residence um, in those two different areas of the site. Um, we also have um, rooms at the site that reflect um, early changes earlier in time that suggest a transition from Chaco into post Chaco and versus other rooms that seem to have maintained Chaco and features and architecture longer through those time periods. So that suggests that we had different families of different origins who are using architecture and using ceramics as our two primary categories differently. Um, Paul, we have a written question. Um, for those of you who are shy about the microphone, um, there are notepads on the table. You feel free to write a question down and uh, I can collect questions as I, as I hop around. Um, we have a question about the significance and dating of the uh, Ponderosa Pine, the famous Ponderosa Pine in the Plaza of Pueblo Benito. Okay, well we have a uh, a, uh, a large um, ponderosa pine that appears in way back in drawings of Chaco Canyon. Um, it was planted in the plaza at Pueblo Benito. Um, the tree has interior or pith dates um, that go well back into the 800s. Um, and then uh, outside or exterior death dates of the tree put it in the 1100s in Chaco. So the tree apparently was transplanted as a small sapling and grew, and we don't know exactly, I don't think anyone's been able to determine exactly when it might have been transplanted, certainly young in its life, and that it grew then in Pueblo Unidos Plaza for several hundred years. It was maintained until it died um, at that point. Okay, do we have another question? Um, Paul, if we could take a, just a step back for a second, because um, it's so close to the mission of the Center for Desert, Desert Archaeology, could you describe what the past 10 years have been like at, at Salmon? What, what challenges you faced as you showed up there and what your major accomplishments were? In two minutes or less? Sure. <laughs> um, okay, well, just to, to, to give folks a little history, um, I, um, I was working in the Farmington area in 2000. Um, I was employed at that point by Navajo Nation Archaeology. I had come to Farmington about a dozen years earlier to do archaeology for the Navajo Nation, and I had worked into a position where we were doing roads archaeology um, prior to construction of roads across mostly the northern part of the reservation. That job had sort of run its cycle, and um, I met Bill Dole and Linda Pierce. Um, uh, and was hired to take on the Salmon job in um, late 2000, early 2001. Um, the primary thrust at that point was to pick up the Salmon research of the 1970s and take a fairly um, voluminous manuscript that stood about this high and had lots and lots of good data from Salmon, um, but not in an organization or manner that was particularly easy to um, distribute at that point and take that into a report that um, Salmon and the center could jointly publish and sort of bring Salmon ruins from 1979, 1980 um, into the present. As part of that project, um, we didn't just sort of pick up old files and organize them and, and turn them into neat, slick graphics. I organized a research team with about a dozen people that looked at Salmon ceramics. Uh, Lori Webster looked at perishables. We did architecture. We did some limited environmental studies. I undertook a, a re-analysis of all the rooms, features. Um, we initiated a curation program to sort of bring the artifacts, um, condition, curation, and database management to what we hoped would be modern standards ultimately. So we undertook um, a number of these areas and 
in 2006, um, the day job, as I came to call it, was finished. We published a three-volume report on Solomon that included about two-thirds of this new, this, these three volumes, about two-thirds was original Solomon research with editing, updates by original authors in many cases, and then one-third of our new research um, put into one package um, that was a complete three-volume set on sort of here's Solomon archaeology as of 2006. Now, at the time I was doing that, we also organized a, the Solomon Working Conference, which was intended to bring this group of about a dozen Solomon researchers, past and present, together with people like Linda Cordell, Gwen Vivian, um, Wokey Toll, um, a number of people doing research in the general area, but not at Solomon. And the intent there was to take the Solomon researchers, outside folks, and really try and get a more synthetic, integrated view of Middle San Juan archaeology. So we worked through that, and in 2008, um, the University of Utah published Chaco's Northern Prodigies, which was um, sort of a state-of-the-art, here's a synthetic look at Solomon Ruins in the middle of San Juan with all the folks who had done research there. Um, so that sort of took us through the synthetic stage, and then um, we went after National Science Foundation money in 2005 to specifically look at the question of Chaco migration to Solomon and Aztec. And so that's why when I talk to you about um, migration out of Chaco, I feel like we have good data to indicate that yes, we have um, the smoking guns for people coming from Chaco to Solomon and Aztec. Um, and we looked at a sample of other sites in the area as well, and we really didn't find um, good clear lines of evidence for those smoking guns. So that's part of what informs my view of Chaco as this very uneven, um, highly variable, very interesting confederation of peoples that wasn't a unified single system, certainly not an empire, um, of people who came to cooperate in this period of time. Um, the important part, one of the important parts of that, of course, is the Chaco and ritual overlay, and we've hinted around at that. When I tell you that Chaco and great houses aren't primarily or only ritual sites, that's not to de-emphasize the ritual in any case, because the ritual was very important to Chaco and folks. And I think that really was the main unifying um, identity that people carried. Um, my colleague Jeff Clark talks about Chaco and ritual and ideology as sort of a meta identity. This is something that exists above the level of individual sites, and this is what integrated these folks and allowed them to cooperate in this network of what was otherwise a pretty mixed group of people living in a bunch of different sites. Alrighty, um, any last questions? Oh, yes. Did, did I hear there was some chocolate found in Chaco and how does that fit in? <laughs> um, well, the, 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 there has been chocolate found. This is um, Patty Crown's research. Um, she found remains of um, cacao inside um, cylinder jars um, from Chaco doing residual trace element studies. Um, and that's wonderful, interesting stuff. I can't tell you a whole lot more about it because um, I haven't yet fully processed that in terms of how I think about it. But certainly we have yet another connection to the south. Um, we have live macaws brought up um, from Mesoamerica into Chaco, uh, at least 33 or 34 in Chaco. We have remains of nine macaws who came to Salmon Pueblo as young birds at some point after about 1090, um, all of whom died before the age of three. Um, so they brought all these birds up for ritual and they all died pretty rapidly. But, you know, let's think about it, folks. Tropical birds in 1090 at Solomon Ruins in a very, you know, deserty environment. And how did they even get the birds alive to Solomon? We actually don't know for a fact that they came alive to Solomon, but if, if they didn't come alive, then they brought up um, recently deceased macaws. But um, certainly some interesting ritual connections. But um, I, I can't really speak much about the chocolate. But next time. Um, for those of you that are interested in the topic of uh, uh, cacao at Chaco Canyon, um, you'll find on our website a uh, video by Patty Crown, um, who recently gave a lecture. And we have the entire video streaming online right now. And you're more than welcome to uh, check in online and watch that lecture. Uh, I believe there were a question over this way. 
Just one more thing on chocolate. Patty Crown will be speaking at the Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society meeting in March. And that's open to, in March. Um, can you ex explain what the National Park um, Service's philosophy is that doesn't encourage or allow excavations of these sites? Um, okay, I can talk about it. I do not work for the National Park Service. Um, Hmm, this is a little political. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think at this point, it's probably fair to say that the Park Service believes that um, a non-excavation based approach in most cases is the best way to pursue archaeology at this time. Now, that's not programmatic. Um, at Aztec Ruins, they have an excavation program that is currently directed towards fill reduction in areas of Aztec that are showing severe structural damage. So in other words, there are areas where you have three-story standing architecture and you have dirt piled up nearly to the top of that. And on the other side, you have rooms perhaps excavated in Earl Morris's time in the 19-teens and you have problems. So as part of their program of stabilization and ruins preservation, they're removing fill from the areas that have high fill and putting in supports and doing things that seem like a good approach to integrated um, site management and stabilization. Um, so I don't know. I, I, the, the time may come when the Park Service looks again to excavation in the proper context in the way that um, the center tries to do it in a very limited fashion to recover um, the right kinds of artifacts and samples with fairly minimal, limited impact to sites to address specific research questions. And I certainly hope that we get to that point again and that it's not, uh, not a long time. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up at this point. Um, Paul, thank you for a very concrete example of how uh, the membership here at the Center for Desert Archaeology supports these sorts of efforts to preserve not just the places of the past, but information about the past. Uh, thank you so much. All right, thank you. And I'd like to take just a second to thank the audience for all the great questions. It's always a great set of questions from the crowd that shows up for these talks, so I really appreciate it. Thanks again, everybody.